My name is Michelle Larson, and whoops, our screen has disappeared. Um, I am an employee at Utah Transit Authority. Part of my job description is the senior records officer. I have several others. Um, most people know me as the Grim Reaper because if I'm coming to your office, I'm going to be wanting stuff, and no one wants that disruption in their job. So. I'm either coming in my capacity as a paralegal or a records officer, and it's not very fun sometimes. We get a lot of records requests at Utah Transit Authority. To date, we've received 132 from the public. Generally, each production averages about 300 pages. And to date, we've had 232 um, record sharing requests. So it keeps me very, very busy. Um, I've had a lot of experience with grandma. I've been working at UTA as a records officer for about 10 years. And prior to that, I spent 30 years in a law firm. So I've been around the block a little bit, so to speak. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about classification. And before we dive into this, one of the first things you need to know are who within your agency has records. And the reason why is before you ever get a grammar request, you need to know where to find things, who has what, what types of records you have, and where to go get them when you get that grammar request. You don't have much time to turn that around. And the last thing I want to do is spend my time going through seven counties trying to figure out who has what. So make sure you know what your records are and who has them. If you have records electronically, that's great because there's an ability to share that quickly. But if someone is siloed, um, put them in a silo in hard copy somewhere, you need to know how to get those quickly. Also, it's really good to know exactly what's on your website. Um, I'm surprised at the number of people that have actually never ventured into the website and see what's, to see what's there. And a lot of times when you get a grammar request, if you've already got that on your website, it's just very easy to refer the requester to that website. And if you have something that's requested often, it may be time just to put that on your website instead of making people go through the process of getting it through grammar if it's indeed a public record. Also, be mindful on how you get records. Um, we do a lot of record sharing. Who's familiar with that here? A lot of people do that. When you receive a record under record sharing, do you staple something to that document to alert people internally how you got that record so that they're not um, going around the classification that was assigned by the originating entity? Or you need to make sure you stamp it in some fashion. Um, we had an instance where we record shared with another agency some security video. And we had told them that we considered it exempt and protected. Um, and I won't go through the classification of that. 
and we asked them if they were going to release any of the images from that to come back to us so that we could help them isolate um, records that were not, or a portion of that that could be given to the public, Does, if that makes sense. They did not do that, and so they had gone out and they had shown images from the video, and it had to do with a violent attack. But they didn't, it was an attack of a woman who had been walking. And the images they were showing showed a whole different woman who became incensed with us because her image was out there in the media as the person that was attacked. And so you need to make sure when you're record sharing or you get records and record sharing that there's some kind of designation on that so people don't share it inappropriately, if that makes sense. Whoops. I'm hitting the button too fast. Also, if you get records as a part of an investigation, you need to make sure that investigation is done and what the determination of that investigation is before anything can be released on that. Um, you wouldn't want to give out records if the investigation is still in process and it could affect the outcome of that investigation. My favorite source is the, the State Archives website they have prepared all kinds of great forms. And if you need help classifying something, I would recommend you pop over to their website and find their forms for classification. Sometimes just walking through the process on a form can be very helpful, especially if you're dealing with something that's a little bit more complex. Um, there's a lot of good resources on their website, so please take advantage of the work product they've already given you. Here is a list of just a few of the records not subject to grandma. We talked about earlier what is not a record. And here's just a partial list. So library books, copyrighted materials, patented documents not owned by the agency. So sometimes if you have a request for proposal and someone in that proposal gives you a claim of confidentiality because they're giving you something that's copyrighted or it's trademarked, and is very specific to a very um, unique process, you don't have the, the ability to reproduce that. Um, personal notes. Now, you have to be careful with that because a personal note is something that has nothing to do with the governmental entity's function. It's not a personal note in a, in the, to the extent it contains any kind of data. So if you are keeping a list that says, you know, go buy bread, go buy milk, oh yeah, and I need to do this, this, and this related to my job, well, it just became a record. So just make sure there's segregation. If you're sending an email, it may start out as a business communication, which is a record, and then maybe because you're friends with the person you're sending it to, you start getting into a personal communication, you need to make sure that you keep those things separate. Um, otherwise, it could be that everyone at some point is going to know, not only did you work on this project, but you went to lunch with so-and-so, and you went shopping with so-and-so, or it kind of went beyond the bounds of that. So make sure you keep those things separate, okay? Temporary drafts. Does anyone deal with drafts a lot? Everything's pr pretty much a draft at some point, right? Temporary is the key word here, though. If you have a draft and you never have a final document created from that draft, does that document still contain that non-record status? No. Okay. And junk mail. I would really like to give my junk mail to someone. If you want to request it, I will give it to you, even though it's not a record. I get a lot of it. Security measures have anything to do with security is exempt. Some of you may have, for example, um, video footage, part of a security system. If you are law enforcement or you work at a um, detention facility, you may have security footage. So does that give everyone a right to come in and see what's happening there that day? No. I, there are some really good state records committee decisions on security issues. 
And if you have a concern that your record is a security issue and you're, you're not quite sure if it falls within these parameters, do some research and go look at the state records committee decisions. They will give you some really great insight as to how they look at those records. Okay, the first premise of grandma is everything is public, correct? Except or unless, those are the kind of the buzzwords there. Um, we have private records and Rosemary, I think in 2006, made a great checkoff sheet and I plagiarized it. I'm just confessing right now, I plagiarized your check, checkoff sheet. And here is a sampling of private records. If you have someone that's new, or if you're new, or if you're going to be gone on vacation and someone is gonna be trying to step into your shoes while you're gone, it's good to have checklists of these types of things so that if they're looking at a record and they have really not a good foundation in grandma, they can make some good decisions about that record if they have to respond in your absence. And this is just um, a short and dirty of what private records are. It's not a comprehensive list, but it's a, it's a good start. We talked about controlled records previously. Um, it's really important that you understand what that record is. And when I get controlled records within our office, I will put those in an envelope and I will seal them and we'll properly label them because you just don't want those type of records accessible not only to the public, but they should be very, um, they should be held locked up within your organization. Not every employee should have access to those as well. And then protected records. Um, again, I, I love checklists. And again, this is another section I plagiarized from a form that you did in 2006, Rosemary. Um, kind of highlighting what a sampling of protected records. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of why it's important to know about your classifications. So we had a, a record share opportunity with another agency and in the course of that we gave them some information about an employee and it included this employee's home address. Well, what had happened is an individual was texting on their phone and hit the back end of one of our buses. Our buses are hard to see, and I, I understand that. They're, they're quite small, and it's, it's hard. You know, that, that bus just jumped out in front of him, and, you know, as it sat there at the red light. And so as he's sitting injured in his car, he looked up, had an epiphany, saw the ad on the back of the bus, and called the attorney phone number that was there. And so there was a law enforcement agency that came out and investigated, and the driver's information was given to that agency. Well, the agency gave that information to the law firm who shared it with their client, who then proceeded to harass and torment our employee. Um, he visited the home late at night. He vandalized the home. He harassed this driver's children. And it was awful. And we had to go through a lot of hoops to make sure this employee was protected. So make sure that when you're giving out information, you've properly redacted it, or you've classified it, or if you're giving it to another agency that you're stamping it correctly, so there's no confusion about how you've classified that record. Um, recently, actually last week, when the Brussels um, explosion occurred that same day, we got a grammar request from an individual his name's Brian, he didn't want to give a last name, didn't want to give an address, didn't want to give a phone number. But he wanted to know where every one of our security cameras were on all of our vehicles, at all our stations, when they are recording, what they're recording, what their view, um, what their view was, and how long we, we held on to those. And then he wanted to know the schematics for those. And, you know, if you weren't a little edgy to begin with, given the circumstances of the day, 
you know, it was important for us to understand exactly what our records were, how the state records committee had classified those types of things, and know that they were security measures and we were not going to give those out. But you, you just have to look really closely at what you're doing. Also, who saw a grammar related story in the news this week? Yeah, so without going into too much detail, because I don't know exactly what happened, because you know the media reported it, and the media is always 100% correct. But it sounds like a records officer or someone within an office gave a record that had um, private information to another individual, who, and that individual uploaded that record with that redaction to a Facebook site. And that information was out in the public for a few days till the subject of the record, who was not the requester, by the way, requested that that information be taken down and it, it took a while for that information to be removed. I am sure that there is a sound of a job opening somewhere. I don't know who, who produced the records as someone who's not the subject of the record, and I don't know the circumstances, but you, you have to be careful because you don't have any control of your record once it leaves your hands. So make sure you're doing it right the first time. So classification occurs when a request is made, not beforehand. You can designate a record series, but you cannot classify until a request is made. Is a cl classification a permanent assignment? Classification can change depending on circumstances. You may have records that are normally public, but if there's a procurement going on, they may take a protected status for a time being. Or you may have records that um, were at one point a public record, but because of a change in how you are processing that record for a business purpose may now contain protected information. So. Every time something's requested, you need to look at the content of the record, not just the record series or what the designation is. Um, whenever I get anything related to contracts, procurement of that nature, I will call the contracts administration office to make sure there's not an open procurement. Um, it's important to know that because you don't want to give records to one entity in an open procurement, if others are not receiving it, it, be, it creates an unfair competitive bid opportunity. So at that point, you need to work with the contracts administrator to say, do you want to give it to all the proposers or should we classify it as protected at this time? Um, you need to look at the records and find out if there's any reason why it's not public. Um, we get a lot of federal oversight uh, especially as it pertains to sensitive security information. And so we need to look at all of our records in that context before we classify it on a state level so that we are not violating any of the federal laws. And then you also need to look, are there other sections of the code outside of grammar that apply to your document? And I have a list of a few of them that I deal with. And if you have sections of the code that you deal with, that aren't that are outside of grandma, I would suggest that you keep a list of those so that if you go on vacation, you can actually take a vacation and someone sitting at your desk can look at that and make some reasonable determination on a classification. I don't know about you, I, I focus on the vacation. It's all about the planning and then going. Let's see. Responding to request, Date stamp everything. I don't know about you, but I get requests where the requester signs it in February, ma mails it like three weeks later, and by the time it gets on my desk, it's not even close to the time that they actually mailed it. So date stamp it because it's, you need to respond within the time frame of when you received it, not when they mailed it. Um, I have a law firm that does this a lot. So they'll put it, they'll have the attorney sign the request and whoever is doing the mail will put it in the mail three weeks later. And then usually within a couple of days, I'll get a call from the attorney saying, you know, you've really missed your deadline. 
we put that request in a while ago. I've got the copy here and I signed it. Why haven't I got those records? And so it's nice to have a record of when you actually got something. Keep a copy of your response and everything you provided for a while. Um, I had a requester two years ago. She asked for the same records within a one year period 12 times. She appealed it to our chief administrative officer six times. And we couldn't figure out why she was appealing because she clearly got the records. And then she appealed to our board chair, who was that second level of appeal at that time. And it was really nice to have that nice big file demonstrating everything that we had done. And finally, after repeatedly going through this, she filed a, a subpoena with the court, pro se, and we were able to show the court that documentation. So protect yourself, make sure you keep copies. And you know you can keep it electronically, in paper copy, whatever, but make sure that you have them. Checklists are good. And we have an internal form that we use, and I've just cut and pasted some pieces in here and to kind of give you an idea. So whenever we get a document, we log when it was received, we check when it's due, we'll look at the um, documents and we'll check these boxes to kind of give us an idea if, if we know right off the bat what that document is classified as, or if we go to the other forms if we need to go through a process. Um, if the access is governed by another law, we'll write it down here. And sometimes we get a document request that's not for something classified as a record, and so we'll make a note of that. When someone is asking for something that's private, We'll also check why they should have access to that. I don't know if any of you get requests from records retrieval places. Um, I have one company out of New Jersey, and I don't know what their deal is, but they will send a re an authorization to a client saying, you know, sign this so we can get your records. And the client will sign it saying, yeah, I authorize you to get my medical records. And they'll take the medical records release send it to a document retrieval firm and say, please go get the police report with that. Do you give it out? Make sure that the person that is signing that release is actually stating what should be released. If they're signing something that says, yeah, go ahead and get my medical records, and they're asking for a police report, they didn't authorize that release, so just double check. Um, sometimes people will just come pick up things at the front desk and we'll ask how that um, person was identified. We just want to make sure we're giving the proper records to the proper person. And as we all know, we need to have, you know, double check that we're getting a government ID with a picture on that. Um, if we need to um, take more time, we'll check the reason and kind of put a notation here. And we also account for our staff time and hours spent. Sometimes we will waive those fees, but it's, it's good to know the record of what was expended in case there's a problem later. And then lastly, if something's appealed, it's nice to document that so that you make sure that whoever is taking that record on appeal knows that what their time frame is and that we know that it was sent. If you have questions, you are more than welcome to email me um, or call me. Sometimes it's just nice to talk through things. Um, not only do I have my own email address, but we also have an email address for anyone making a records request from, um, from UTA. And if you're law enforcement, we also have a different law or email address for you um, so that we can make sure that those things that are really time sensitive on an investigation get out really quickly. And that's really helpful. Does anyone have questions now? When you were clarifying the private controlled, you had mentioned personal notes. Yeah. Okay. 
I work for a city where we have department heads and such who keep notebooks that daily they write in information for meetings they attend and such. And we've actually, over the last six months, had a request for that, a copy of that. Would that be, and we did not release it saying it was his personal notes, but it did have to do with work. I would have probably gone through the exercise of classifying that and saying that was a record. And that's my personal opinion, because if it's conducting the government's business and it has to do with a decision they made, or if it has to do with a process, the public, if it's a public document, has a right to get that. Thank you. That's it goes back to the record, no matter the format. If it's ha just because it's not typed and it's handwritten, mm -hmm. doesn't exempt it from that. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you.